I am grateful to God for the privilege of being with you this evening. <clears throat> I appreciate so much the excessively benevolent introduction by Brother Johnny Ramsey. He's always so kind and so lavish in his encouragement of gospel preachers. And I'm grateful for that and for our longtime friendship. It is my responsibility this evening to discuss with you a doctrine that occupies a major portion in the thinking of the denominational community. It is popularly known in Roman Catholic circles as the concept of original sin. In Protestant denominational circles, it is more readily recognized as the doctrine of hereditary total depravity. And it is the idea that when Grandfather Adam sinned against Almighty God, that he underwent a complete transformation of nature, both body and soul, so that all of his descendants have contracted that original Adamic sin. It is therefore argued that infants, when they come into this world, are tainted with the guilt of Adam's sin. Now, the doctrine is bad enough within itself, but it has spawned other equally anti-biblical concepts. For example, the doctrine of original sin is responsible for the idea that in order to experience conversion, there must be a supernatural direct operation of the Holy Spirit upon that corrupted soul, thus allowing the individual at that point to then repent and believe and hence to enter into a relationship with God. The doctrine of original sin is also at the base of the practice of baby baptism. If the Bible teaches that the design of baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, and it does, and if the Word of God likewise teaches that infants are sinners, then it would necessarily follow that infants ought to be subject to baptism. But of course, the fallacy in that particular argument would be the minor premise. Children are not born into this world sinners. I don't know when the doctrine of original sin was first conceived. There does seem to be some evidence of the fact that in the first century it was believed. At least to some degree. For example, in the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, after our Lord had healed a man who had been born blind, and that stirred the wrath of the leaders of the Jewish community so that they began to interrogate the man and wanted to know what his opinion was of this individual who had restored his sight. The man argued that uh, Jesus obviously was a prophet. For he said, nobody from the very beginning of the world has been able to do what this man has done. That is, open the eyes of a man born blind. They finally became so exasperated with the man, they said, what do you know? You were altogether born in sin. Well, I don't know if they entertained exactly the same concept as the modern advocates of this notion or not, but there seems to be some root form of it at least there. 
But to really develop the concept historically, one has to come this side of the completion of the New Testament record into that period of history that's known as the Antinicene period. That is, the period between the conclusion of the biblical record near the end of the first century and the middle of the fourth century A.D. There was a post-apostolic writer by the name of Irenaeus who in one of his epistles in the early second century A.D. made the statement that Christ came into this world to save infants and children and young men and old men. He didn't mention anything about women in that connection, but he did give a rather broad spectrum of possibilities for salvation. Well, if Christ came to save infants, that contains an implication, does it not? For the Bible says Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. A little bit later, there was a writer by the name of Tertullian who added a dimension to this concept in that, so far as we know, he was the first one to introduce the idea that a baby not only inherits its body from its parents, but it also inherits its soul. So that not only do we come into this world with bodies that suffer the consequences of sin, we come into this world with souls that likewise suffer the consequences of sin, that is, the guilt of sin. And before we're finished with this discussion tonight, I will discuss the idea, a lot of people hold it, particularly the Lutherans, subscribe to the idea that the soul is inherited, just as the body is. The first man to defend sprinkling uh, of infants was an individual in the 3rd century A.D. whose name was Cyprian, and he based his defense of infant baptism upon the premise that infants are in fact sinners and therefore they need to be baptized. So the concept of original sin is certainly post-apostolic. It has no biblical basis, and it is therefore to be rejected. What I want to do, folks, for a few moments this evening, and I hope maybe many of you have your Bibles with you, because I want to take just two or three points and very carefully develop them and give you some rich information to take home with you. You might want to make a notation or two in your Bible as we pass along. Now, What I want to do, first of all, is this. Out of the about 30 or 40 different passages that are employed as proof texts by those who believe in the concept of original sin from the Bible, I will select the major one from the Old Testament, the major one from the New Testament. These are the killing arguments, they believe, that absolutely establish the case. We will analyze each of these and introduce a biblical response to them. The first, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Old Testament is Psalm 51 and 5, where David said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now it is alleged that here is a clear biblical affirmation for the concept of original sin. What shall we say to that? Well, several things. First of all, we are dealing here with a poetic passage from the Old Testament. Poetic literature is frequently highly fraught with symbolic language. And one of the commonest rules of Bible interpretation is this. You cannot extract a passage from poetic literature, from symbolic language,
and build a doctrine upon it, particularly when that doctrine contradicts other plain, prosaic portions of the Word of God. It is an act of utter desperation to attempt an interpretive procedure of that nature. Now, as we shall subsequently point out, there are many passages in the Bible that affirm the innocency and the purity of children. And it is therefore not legitimate to reach into the Psalms, to reach into poetic literature, and to build an argument that contradicts other plain Bible passages. Now, how do we interpret Psalm 51.5? Well, there are a number of viable possibilities. And what I mean by viable possibilities, I mean possibilities that are consistent with the ancient text and consistent with the overall teaching of the Bible. Now, let me mention just two of these. Some believe that in Psalm 51, David is figuratively describing the sin which he committed with Bathsheba, the sin of adultery, in which a child was conceived. And that David is poetically expressing his penitence in that he puts, as it were, figuratively speaking, a statement of penitence into the mouth of that child that was conceived. And he thus symbolically has the child saying, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In other words, that's David's figurative way in this particular passage of acknowledging the great sin which he committed with Bathsheba. Some of our old restoration preachers used to argue this case rather strongly and they would use it in debate with denominational preachers and I think perhaps rather effectively. But there may be another explanation that is equally viable. And it might be this, that David is simply in this passage by the employment of a figure of speech known as a hyperbole, which is an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis that David is saying that his life has been principally a life in which he has felt the burden of sin. It seems that sin has haunted him, has stalked him, as it were, all the days of his life, figuratively even from the time of his birth. Now is that a legitimate exegetical possibility? Well, it certainly is. And let me give you a passage. Take your Bibles, please, and turn with me. And let's look at a passage for just a moment in the book of Job. In Job chapter 31, Job is responding to some of the accusations which his critics have made. As you know, his friends came to visit him and they began to put pressure on him to confess some secret sin in his life that had brought about all of the misfortune which had come upon him. Job, what are you guilty of? We know some secret sin has been committed by you. Now just fess up and tell what it is. And they charged him with all sorts of things if you read the series of speeches which they make. One of the allegations which they made against him was that he had neglected his benevolent responsibilities, that he had not cared for the fatherless, that he had not administered care for the widow. And therefore, that's the reason why he suffered so. And in Job chapter 31, he is responding to that argument that has been addressed to him. And I want to read verse 38. I'm reading from the American Standard Translation. If you have your Bibles, read along with me and note this. Job says in Job 31, 18, Nay, from my youth, watch it, he grew up with me as with a father. Who are you talking about, Job? I'm talking about the orphan. I cared for him since the days of my youth. I have been his father since the time of my youth. Now draw a circle around the word youth. Youth. 
And notice the next phrase, which in Hebrew parallelism repeats the same thought with different language. Look at this. And her, her whom? The widow. Her have I guided from my mother's womb. Well, do tell. Job, do you mean on day one of your birth, you were out guiding and taking care of widows? Not literally, of course not. Well, what do you mean? Well, from the womb is parallel to youth in the first part of the verse. Draw a circle around youth, draw a circle around womb, and connect them. They are parallel in the symbolism of the passage. Now you ought to write this passage in the margin of your Bible in connection with Psalm 51.5. Because that could be the very same emphasis that David is giving. I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. What do you mean, David? I mean that I have been sinning since my early youth, but not all the way back to conception. But that's a hyperbole. Most of my life, I have been bothered by sin. Now that's a possibility that does not deny other plain Bible information. Now, a second favorite text that the denominationalists employ is found in Ephesians 2. If you'd care to, turn in your Bible there, and I want to give you two or three notations to make in this connection. And these are devastating. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul writes this, And you, did he make alive, when you were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the powers of the air, of the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all once lived in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Now here's the way the advocates of original sin interpret this passage. You were by nature the children of wrath. They substitute the word birth for nature. By birth you became children of wrath. That is, hereditarily, totally depraved. Little devils born into this world, totally corrupted with the Adamic sin. Well, let me show you about three strikes against that theory from the context here. You know, I always thought that Generally, when someone perverts a Bible passage and builds up on it a fallacious doctrine, about nine times out of ten, the answer to exploding that particular fallacy is found right there in the context. Now watch this. Are you ready to mark? Here we go. Verse 1, And you did he make alive... When you were dead through, underline it, your trespasses. Not Adam's trespasses, but your trespasses. You might just want to underline the word your and put an arrow out to the margin and write in, not Adam's. Now that'll just clue you into that from now on. So we're not talking about an Adamic sin that was inherited. We're talking about personal sin. We die through our personal transgressions. Now, secondly, drop down to verse 3 in the latter part of the verse and let's note several things. First of all, the word nature. That word does not automatically stand for birth. The term is used generically in the Greek New Testament and the precise meaning of it is determined by the context in which it is found. And one of the standard definitions given for the term in the Greek lexicons is this, that which is habitually practiced. 
what you do by nature because you've been practicing it so long that it becomes second nature, as we would say. The point is, it is not necessarily equivalent with birth. But secondly, note this. The text says you were, by nature, children of wrath. I want to make an argument here from the form that this verb takes in the Greek New Testament that is tremendously important, but the average English reader does not pick up on it. The verb translated were here in the Greek New Testament is an imperfect tense middle voice form. Well, what does that mean? Well, the imperfect tense represents repetitive action as viewed in the past. Not just an act, but repetitive action looked at as occurring in the past. Well, what's the point in that? The point is this. The apostle here is not looking back to an act of sin whereby someone became a sinner. That conception that occurred at an instant in the past whereby they automatically became a sinner. That is not what he's saying. He's saying you repeatedly have sinned in the past so that by nature, by practice, you deserve the wrath of God. There is no illusion to a sinful conception in the tense of that verb. But secondly, as I suggested a moment ago, it is in what the grammarians call the middle voice. Now the Greek has three voices, active, passive, and middle. Let me illustrate. The active voice represents the subject as acting. The passive voice represents the subject as being acted upon. And the middle voice represents the subject as acting in some way that affects himself. Let me illustrate. Active voice, I hit the ball. Passive voice, I was hit by the ball. Middle voice, I hit myself with the ball. You see the difference? Now, if Paul had intended to convey the idea that we have become sinners by virtue of Adam's sin and our conception as children, the ideal way to represent that would have been with the passive voice. We became children of wrath. Not because of anything we did, but because of something somebody else did. We were passive in the activity, and therefore passively we became children of wrath. But that is not what he said. The middle voice form. It could be paraphrased like this. We made ourselves the children of wrath. Personal responsibility. That totally destroys the sectarian argument that is made on this passage. Finally, this one point. If children are born sinners and they die in that condition, there is only one conclusion. They are lost. Now, the denominational world doesn't want to deal with this. The Roman Catholic Church has conveniently invented a doctrine. Limbo. What happens to a child who is unbaptized who dies? They can't go to heaven. They don't go to hell. Where do they go? Well, we don't know. Let's invent some limbo. Now, the Protestant world has hung out on that. And so they don't believe at this current stage of the evolutionary development of their doctrine that babies that die unbaptized go to hell. They used to affirm that. Years ago in public debate. Now you rarely ever will hear one say it. But let me tell you something. If this passage 
provides a proof text for the doctrine of hereditary total depravity, these individuals here are described as children of blank. What? Wrath. If this passage is talking about the contamination of babies, it likewise teaches the destruction of babies in hell. The individuals here are characterized as children of wrath, meaning they are individuals who are deserving of the wrath of God. Now you're going to have to swallow that whole package if your case is built upon it. And so the passage does not teach that, ladies and gentlemen. It simply does not. Now, having talked about that for a moment, let's develop our line of argument along two or three other principles. First of all, the Bible clearly teaches the concept of individual responsibility. If I can establish the fact that every individual is responsible for his own sin, and that every individual will be judged by God in the final analysis on the basis of his or her personal conduct, then, of course, that destroys the idea that the consequences of sin, spiritually speaking, have been inherited from Adam. I think one of the clearest passages in all of the Word of God on this matter is found in the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 20. Let's look at it for a moment. You need to draw a box around this passage because it's dynamite. The prophet of God said this. Listen to him carefully. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. Now hear this. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. But the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. You have two sides of the same coin addressed in that passage. One does not inherit sin from his parents. Neither does he inherit obedience from his parents. But rather... He stands as an individual accountable before God. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. He is responsible for his own submission to God's plan of righteousness. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. He is not held guilty before God for the sins of his parents. Now perhaps at this point it would be good to pause and put a footnote and to observe that while we do not inherit the guilt of Adam's sin, we do nevertheless inherit the consequences of sin as introduced into this world by Adam. Now Paul argues this matter in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. By one man sin entered into the world and death through sin so that death hath passed unto all men, for that all hath sinned. Even pure little babies suffer the consequences of Adam's sin. Babies get sick. Babies die. But babies do not contract the guilt of Adam's sin. They are not sinners. So there's a vast difference between inheriting the consequences of sin and inheriting the guilt of sin. The former is true, the latter is untrue. So Ezekiel 18.20 is a marvelous passage addressing one facet of this particular matter. Well, let's turn to a passage in the New Testament that is equally potent. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, the inspired apostle in discussing the coming day of judgment says this, for we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, hear him now, that each one, that each one 
give an account for his own conduct. For the sins which are manifest in his body. And so the passage teaches individual responsibility as we stand before Christ in judgment. Each individual giving an account of himself to the Lord. Paul argues similarly in Romans chapter 14 when he says, Every man shall give an account of himself unto the Lord. So there is no such thing as God holding us spiritually responsible for the sins of someone else. Next, let me introduce two or three passages which affirm, as I said a moment ago, or imply at least, the innocency and the purity of children. There's an interesting passage in the book of Genesis, chapter 8 and verse 21, that I think speaks to this point. And you might want to mark the particular word found in the text here. In Genesis 8 and 21, Moses wrote these words, The imagination of man's heart is on evil from his Y-O-U-T-H, youth. And in my Bible, I've done this. I underscored the word youth. And in the margin I wrote, not birth. The imagination of man's heart is on evil. From when? Not from birth, but from youth. That passage does not sanction the concept of hereditary depravity. Then, of course, there is the common passage that we have frequently appealed to in Matthew chapter 18. Where our Lord said this, Except you be converted, or as the American Standard Translation has it, Except you turn again, watch it now, and become as little children, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, folks, there is a standard rule of Bible interpretation which suggests this. Anytime you correctly define a word or you introduce another term that is synonymous with your original term, one can be substituted for the other and the sentence will still make perfectly good sense. I sometimes use this argument to illustrate that baptism cannot be sprinkling. In Matthew 3, for example, we are told that John baptized people in the Jordan. Now, if the word baptized means sprinkled, you could translate the passage like this. John sprinkled people in the Jordan. Well, how did he do it? Grind them up? And John sprinkled people in the Jordan. You don't sprinkle people, you sprinkle water on people in infant baptism. So the definition doesn't work. However, if you you substitute the word immersed, it makes good sense. John immersed people in the Jordan. That's all right. But you can't say John poured people in the Jordan. John sprinkled people in the Jordan. No, no. The definition is not correct. Now, to make that point with reference to Matthew chapter 18, if children, listen to this now, are born hereditarily, totally depraved. What's depraved mean? Wicked. What's totally mean? 100%. Can you get any more depraved? than totally depraved? No. The devil is totally depraved. If children are born into this world totally depraved, then they are born devils. Now how would the passage read? Would this make good sense? Where our Lord said, Unless you are converted and become as little devils, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. If children are hereditarily totally depraved, 
how in the world would it have made any sense at all for our Lord to have held them up as models for those who aspired to enter into His kingdom? Well, what was He emphasizing there? Why their genuineness, their sincerity, their humility, their teachability, all of these marvelously good and wonderful traits are incorporated in the word children there, dispositions concerning which we ought to emulate. Here's another instance. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20, when the Apostle Paul was dealing with the problem of spiritual gifts in the church at Corinth, and brethren were fussing and fighting, and some said, My gift is better than yours, and I'll speak in tongues whether any interpreter is present or not. And all sorts of chaos afflicted the Corinthian congregation in terms of their miraculous gifts. And Paul got after them. He rebuked them. And notice what he said. In 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he said, Brethren, in mind, be not children... What does that mean? Don't be infantile in the way you think. Be mature in the way you think. All right. What's the second part of the verse say? But in malice be ye babes. You know what the emphasis of that is? Babes don't have malice. Therefore, in malice be like babies. Babies don't have malice. But if babies are hereditarily totally depraved, then they must. Paul indirectly affirms the purity, the innocency of children in that passage. That conclusion necessarily comes. Well, I left myself a little short in terms of discussing this doctrine that the soul is inherited. The Bible does not sanction that notion. The Bible makes a clear-cut distinction between man's body and his soul, and there is no uh, inextricable union between the two so that whatever one does, the other is automatically contaminated or affected by it. The Bible teaches that our body has come from our parents, but our souls come from God. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12 and verse 7, The dust returneth unto the ground from whence it came, but the Spirit unto God who gave it. In the book of Zechariah, the prophet of God said, Jehovah God formeth the spirit of man which is in him. And I think one of the finest passages on this particular point is Hebrews 12, 9 where the inspired writer says this, notice the distinction he draws between the fathers of our flesh and the father of our spirits. He said, we had fathers in the flesh who chastised us and we gave them reverence. How much more ought we to revere Him who is the father of our spirits? If we are born with corrupt spirits, that contains an implication that reflects upon God. Because the Bible says He's the Father of our spirits. The doctrine of original sin, hereditary total depravity, is a non-biblical concept. And may we be able to teach with grace and with love our denominational friends concerning this error.